Kenya's Supreme Court annuls last month's presidential election result following a challenge by the opposition. The decision again plunges the East African nation into political turmoil. They've swapped their rifles for roses, but they're keeping their controversial name. Former FARC rebels form a political party in Colombia. And the death toll from violence in northern Burma rises to 400 amid violent clashes between Rohingya Muslims and government forces. Those are your latest headlines on France 24. I'm Alexander Rocot. Kenya's Supreme Court has thrown out last month's presidential election result and ordered a new ballot within 60 days. On August the 8th, President Uhuru Kenyatta was re-elected with 54% of the vote, but opposition leader Relo Dinga, who had 44%, contested the result and the court ruled by 4-2 to two in his favour. Odinga had harsh words for the people in charge of conducting last month's vote. We have no faith at all in the Electoral Commission as currently constituted. They have committed criminal acts. Most of them actually belong to jail. And therefore we are going to ask for prosecution of all the Electoral Commission officers who have caused this monstrous crime against the people of Kenya. Now, Uhuru Kenyatta has said he'll respect the ruling, although he disagrees with it and urged calm in a country that has a history of post-election violence. Meanwhile, the decision sent opposition members dancing in the street with joy. Catherine Viet has further reactions from Kenya. Scenes of jubilation in the streets of Nairobi. After news of the Supreme Court's decision to annul the results of the presidential election due to irregularities. For supporters of opposition candidate Rala Odinga, history has just been made. And I want to tell you that we are celebrating because justice has been delivered to the people. This time around we want free and fair election. Here in Magare, we want to say we are so happy with the judges because uh, this is what we are waiting for. This is the big day that we are waiting for. The announcement of President Uhuru Kenyatta's re-election on August 11th was followed by several days of protest and sporadic violence in opposition strongholds across the country. There were fears that it would spark a repeat of the deadly bloodshed that killed more than 1,200 people after the 2007 election. In the wake of the Supreme Court's decision, both candidates have appealed for calm. Now more fires have broken out at a chemical plant near Houston, sending toxic plumes of thick black smoke into the air. Flooding caused by Hurricane Harvey has knocked out the electricity supply necessary for keeping volatile chemicals refrigerated. Officials say an anal analysis of the smoke on Thursday showed no reason for alarm, however. Meanwhile, rescue efforts continue in the southeastern Texas, where many people remain stranded. And the mayor of Houston has warned residents in the west of the city that it may be weeks before their homes dry out. Our correspondent Gallagher Fenwick is on the ground. We're right next to one of the hardest hit areas. This place is still flooded and we're being told by police that we can't get any closer to the water simply because this entire area has just received a mandatory evacuation order. This is yet more proof that this is still very much a situation of crisis and urgency unfolding here in Houston with residents being forced at times on a daily basis to leave everything behind only to be told several hours later that they may return, but only at their own risk. The crisis, the problem out here, more specifically speaking, is not so much that water levels are rising, but that the floods have caused serious issues with gas and electricity supplies that could put lives at risk. Now, Hurricane Harvey is set to be the most expensive natural disaster in U.S. history, with estimated costs going into the tens of billions. Kyle Brown takes us for a look at the economic impact of the storm. As the waters in Houston recede, the scale of damage left by Hurricane Harvey is starting to become clear. Some parts of the U.S.'s fourth largest city will be uninhabitable for weeks and possibly months due to flooding and water damage, mold and disease-ridden water. 
Ahead of Saturday's visit to Texas and Louisiana, Let's pray together, may we? President Donald Trump vowed to help those affected. I declared a major disaster in the state of Texas to ensure that federal aid is available for state and local recovery efforts. I also approved a disaster declaration for Louisiana. Organizations like the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, and faith-based organizations are actively assisting on the ground, and they are doing a fantastic job. Estimates of damage to homes and businesses vary, but experts predict the final bill to be in the tens of billions of dollars, making it one of the costliest storms in U.S. history. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina caused damages of more than $170 billion, about half of which was covered by insurance. But most Texas home insurance policies don't cover damage from rain or flooding. Harvey will have ripple effects across the economy too. Texas's oil industry processes a third of America's oil. And companies such as ExxonMobil have shut down their facilities and it will be weeks before refineries return to full operation. This could push up gasoline prices at the pump, but authorities reassured motorists ahead of Labor Day weekend that fuel is being shipped in from neighboring states. Now for half a century, they carried out killings and kidnappings in northern Colombia and left, that left more than 300,000 people dead or missing. But now former FARC guerrillas have relaunched as a political party. Following a week-long conference in Bogota, the recently disarmed group unveiled a new logo, which replaces rifles with roses. And they also changed the name of their FARC acronym, although keeping it is proving highly sensitive. Kicking off their political lives with an old-fashioned vote. Just over two-thirds of the former guerrillas chose to keep the name FARC, opting for their old title over the alternative New Colombia. It's a familiar acronym with a new meaning. Once the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the name now stands for Common Alternative Revolutionary Force. But for many Colombians, the acronym still stands for 52 years of civil war that killed over 200,000 people. The violence came to a formal end just last year, when the rebel group signed a peace deal with the government. The fighters laid down their arms and began integrating back into civil society transforming their armed battle into a political one. Our movement will transform, starting from this meeting now, to become an exclusively political organization that will carry out its activities through legal means. The party also ditched the crossed guns of their former logo. Their new emblem is a red rose, a symbol of socialism in many countries. With 10 seats in Congress guaranteed under the peace deal, the FARC party says they plan to fight corruption and promote arts and culture. They'll have around six months to change their image among Colombians before their first political contest, the country's general elections, next spring. Now, the worst floods to hit, floods to hit Southeast Asia in a decade have left more than 1,400 people dead and focused attention on poor planning in regions that experience annual monsoon rains. Over the past two months, the heavy rains have caused widespread damage in India and Bangladesh, as well as Nepal, where residents are trying to pick up the pieces as the waters recede. Catherine Viet has more. As the monsoon season winds down, floodwaters still cover most of the land. In this village in Nepal, many of the houses have been destroyed. The residents left destitute. We've received only two kilos of rice, a tent, and some clothes from different groups as help. But our main problem is our house. It's beyond repair. Our house is totally destroyed by the flood. Not all the people are getting help. We need help rebuilding our houses, and we're urging the government to help us. Those who are able travel several kilometers to get some assistance. Nepal is one of the country's hardest hit by this year's monsoons. Meanwhile, in Karachi, Pakistan's largest city, the population is still reeling from the disaster. More than a dozen people died in the flooding. There was a giant flood in Karachi and many people died yesterday. The rain caused a lot of damage. Many areas remained without electricity and some areas still remain without power. But life is returning to normal now. 
Flooding caused by monsoons has killed more than a thousand people in Nepal, India and Pakistan. Forty million people have lost their homes and businesses or seen their crops destroyed. Brazilian peacekeeping soldiers deployed to Haiti have officially wrapped up their 13-year UN military mission to the Caribbean country. Rudaba Abbas has the story. Brazilian Defense Minister Raul Jungmann flew in especially to oversee the ceremony in Port-au-Prince on Thursday. The last Brazilian peacekeeping soldiers in Haiti have officially wrapped up their UN military assignment after 13 years. The United Nations Stabilization Mission was deployed to help stem political violence following the ousting of President Jean-Bertrand Aristide when the nation was on the brink of collapse. Many of his supporters have long viewed the mission as something of an occupying army. The teams have provided humanitarian assistance in the aftermath of numerous natural disasters. But the UN's reputation was sullied in 2010, when Nepalese peacekeepers leaked waste into a river, resulting in the first cholera cases to appear in the country. It led on to the deaths of more than 9,000 Haitians. The battalion's mission is expected to be fully wrapped up by mid-October. It will be replaced by a new two-year UN mission, which will involve training Haiti's national police as part of an effort to help the country bolster the rule of law. An, an estimated 38,000 Rohingya Muslims have crossed into Bangladesh, fleeing deadly violence in Burma's northern Rakhine state. Nearly 400 people have died in clashes which began when Rohingya militants attacked Burmese border posts, causing a violent crackdown by government forces. The UN is urging the army now to show restraint as reports of massacres continue to grow. Nadia Massey has more. Houses burn in this majority Buddhist village in Rakhine state. Burmese authorities claim Rohingya rebels attacked the villagers who escaped on foot. Our people shouted, shoot, shoot. So the rebels thought the soldiers were coming and they fled. Then we picked up our children and ran. This latest violence began a week ago. Rohingya rebels attacked police posts. The army responded with a massive counteroffensive. Its commanders maintain they're clearing out terrorists. But Rohingya civilians say they're being explicitly targeted. A warning echoed by international monitors. The information we're getting from refugees coming across the border, uh, they're coming across the border with bullet wounds, with shrapnel wounds. Quite clearly this is a scorched earth uh, offensive by the Burmese military. They're trying to find these insurgents, but you know, they're going after the civilians. The UN says 38,000 people have fled across the Bangladeshi border. Some 20,000 others are waiting to cross, and scores have drowned attempting the journey. Thanks for being with us. Stay tuned for more news and information on France 24.